Hi everybody. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about scalable and privacy preserving compromise detection in the cloud. And I want to take a minute about introducing what are the type of VMs that clouds operate to kind of enforce why we care about this problem. So clouds operate two types of VMs typically. One type of VM is those VMs that run the provider's own workload. So these are first what we call first party VMs. These run services such as Bing, such as other services that the cloud operates. And we also provide third party VMs that our customers are running. Now, the first party VMs that we run ourselves, that, are, that run our workloads, are very strongly protected by strong compromise detection systems that we own, that we also provide to our customers that they can opt in and use. But many customers don't opt in and don't use these systems, which is why many of our customer VMs are not protected by the compromise detection systems that we as a cloud provide. So when we looked at this problem, we found that less than 5% of cloud customers are actually using the strong compromise detection systems that clouds are providing. And the problem, the reason for this is that they're concerned about privacy often, and they don't want to let a third party code that is for, from the provider to run on the, their VMs. And they're also concerned about the performance overhead that these compromise detection systems are imposing. And so the goal of this project was to try to allow operators to provide um, privacy preserving compromise protection at data center scale without basically, uh, while addressing the, uh, the concerns that the, our customers have. So you might be asking, okay, if customers aren't concerned about their own uh, security, why would the operator care? And the reason for this is that even though customers might not care, if their VMs are compromised, they can do damage to other customers in the cloud and they can do damage to the cloud infrastructure. Just to give an example, in a single day from the 5% of VMs that we are monitoring using our strong compromise detection systems, about 1,600 of them were engaged in SQL injection attacks. 186 were involved in DDoS attacks. And 74 were engaged in brute force attacks. And this is only from that 5% of VMs that I mentioned. Just try to imagine what happens if you scale that to the full cloud, especially given that we imagine that those customers that haven't opted in into the compromise detection systems we offer are less security aware. Now, another point I want to make, and this is a result that's well known in the security community, which is VMs and machines in, on the internet are constantly under attack. So we tried this experiment where we created VMs in the three major clouds. And we looked at how fast they started to get attacked um, by various IP addresses over the internet and how frequently those attacks were happening. Most of those VMs were discovered in less than a minute. Most of them, those VMs were also getting multiple login attempts per second. So if any of these attacks succeed, you can imagine that the number of VMs that get compromised can be huge. Just to bear, uh, reinforce this point a little bit more, we also created 100 VMs in our own cloud infrastructure where we monitored them closely so that they couldn't damage any of the, uh, our other VMs. And we used the most popular passwords over the internet to see how quickly they would get compromised. And as you can see, like the minimum time to compromise was about five minutes. And the maximum was about 47 hours. So it took less than two days for every single one of these VMs to get compromised. So our goal is to try to be able to protect all VMs in a cloud without requiring customer permissions to do so, without requiring customers to actually opt in to use the system. And this requires a system that has low performance overhead, a system that preserves customer privacy, and one that can basically follow all GDPR mandates that are now imposed on companies such as Azure, uh, Azure and um, AWS and Google. So the main insights that we used to build such a system was first and foremost that once a VM gets compromised, oftentimes we observe that its connection pattern and its flow patterns change. And this change, and I'm emphasizing the word change here because that is what we are using to detect if a VM is compromised, is going to be an indicator that we can use. But the, more, the other more interesting insight is we do have 5% of the VM, some of which we actually own, that give us a cont continuous stream of detections that we can use sort of for, as labels to learn what is the change that is imposed when a VM is getting compromised. And so the, the main hypothesis we wanted to test in this work was to see, can we learn the change in network behavior that is caused from a VM getting compromised? 
Now the challenge here is obviously, first of all, we can't have any visibility into the VM because to have that, we need customer permissions to do so. We have to maintain customer privacy, so that means that we cannot use things like raw IP addresses. And we have to run at data center scale and at running rate, which would mean that we cannot run packet captures, for example, on every single one of our servers, and we cannot use things like deep packet inspection. So what we do is we build a system called PrivateEye, and what PrivateEye does is it uses a coarse-grained flow pattern summary, and I'll talk about what this means in a second, um, to detect whether the VM is compromised or not. It's scalable, and it doesn't require customer permissions to run. And so our contributions are, first and foremost, to show how we can collect such data while maintaining customer privacy. Um, we have a collection agent that has been running in Azure for over two years now that, that is collecting this data. And finally, we have a novel approach that encodes this information into features for machine learning that encode the change in the graph that happens, in the flow graph that happens uh, once, in a, once a VM gets compromised. So I want to make sure one more point before I go into how PrivateEye actually works. So the goal of PrivateEye is to provide a compromise detection system that can operate at scale. So it sacrifices precision for scalability and privacy. So compared to the strong compromise detection systems that Azure is providing already, it has a 95.77% true positive rate and about a 1% false positive rate. So once we detect something, we have things that are more heavyweight, compromise detection systems that are much more heavyweight that we can't run at scale that we can then run to verify if our detections are actually correct. So again, the goal here is to, to, to maintain scale, not to necessarily be 100% precise. So how does PrivateEye actually work? So we collect network connection patterns but we can't do so by using traditional systems that are already available. So what does that mean? So we have things that already deployed in Azure, for example, NetFlow, NetFlow and IPv6, which are standard industry practices, which collect one out of 4,096 packets that go through the network core. The problem with these solutions is that they're biased towards what we call elephant flows, so heavy flows, and they're also biased towards what we call chatty VMs, VMs that communicate a lot. And so while these solutions might be useful for detecting things like DDoS attacks and volumetric attacks, they're not effective at detecting all sorts of compromise. We can't use systems such as Marple, which require changing hardware, because right now, in most cloud infrastructures, these hardware are not yet deployed. And so while these solutions seem promising, as of now, right now in our clouds, we cannot use them. So the system architecture we have is something like this, where we leverage to be able to collect the network data that we need is the fact that every single server in our cloud has a virtual switch that has to route traffic. So what can we do? We can query that virtual switch every 10 seconds and ask what are the flows that you have active at this point and how much traffic are they sending and receiving. Now there's one catch here, which is the interface that we have to this virtual switch is used by other applications in our cloud as well, and so it has a read lock, and so we have to be careful to not impact ongoing traffic. And to do that, we also need to do some form of sampling. The goal here is to do sampling that does not bias us towards heavy hitters and doesn't bias us towards, again, chatty VMs. And we looked at the number, amount of traffic that VMs are sending, and we decided that, okay, 5,000 seems to be a reasonable number because most of our VMs have less than 5,000 active flows in the 10-second period that we're interested in. So we basically sample based on that number. Okay, so now we need to create features that machine learning can use to be able to detect the change in the network behavior that was caused by that compromise. And I'm gonna only walk through what we use to be able to detect the change in the connections to various IPs over the internet. Again, keep in mind, we're not able to store IP addresses for a long period of time. We just use these, create the features, and then delete the data that we have so that we don't have GDPR um, constraints um, that we need to deal with. So uh, why is creating IP features or graph features hard? First, again, because of privacy. So we, again, can't use the IP addresses themselves. We anonymize these using a, a, an HMAC and then delete them after feature, feature extraction. But the more interesting challenge is if you were to create one feature per IP address you had, you would have two to the 32 features, potentially, right? And anybody who's done any machine learning would tell you that you need as many data points to learn from, almost, 
as a number of features you have. In, and if you think about what that would mean, is you need some order of millions of data points of compromise examples to learn what a, comprom what a change induced by a compromise would look like. And this would not scale. So what we do instead is we create an intelligent hash of these connections that would tell us what the change is going to look like, but would not compromise privacy. So we create what we call temporal and spatial features. Um, and I'll walk through each of them uh, in, in a second. The temporal features encode the change in time of the VM's behavior. So how has my VM's behavior and connection pattern changed from five minutes ago, from 10 minutes ago, from an hour ago, compared to both itself, compared to other VMs the customer owns, and compared to the data center at large. And then spatial features are much more simple. They encode basically uh, which geographic regions essentially the VM is connecting to over time. So basically the idea here is we um, bucketize each flow and we bucketize it based on CDFs that we construct. So we construct a CDF of the, for each individual IP, the connections that VM had over time to that particular IP and other VMs a customer owned had to that particular IP. And we bucketize that CDF, and I'm showing three buckets here. In the actual paper, we use five. This is more for visualization purposes. But again, you can think about the top 1%, the middle of the CDF, and the bottom of the CDF. And we bucketize each flow into where in the CDF it falls into. So take this example. I have a, the num a CDF of the number of bytes to send to a particular IP address. And I have a particular flow from a VM with an IP 1234, let's say, to that IP address. I looked at the CDF over time that I built for that VM. I looked that it falls into the middle of that CDF, so that particular flow gets into that middle bucket for that CDF. Now we can have f different versions of these CDFs. We use four different CDFs that we construct, so one, each flow gets hashed basically to a four-dimensional feature. Again, as I said, our spatial features are a little bit more simple. Um, they basically just tell us whether this is, VM is connecting to another VM that this customer owns. Is it connecting to another VM that is in our own data centers? Or is it uh, a flow that is going to outside of our data center? And this basically constructs our feature set. We have also port-based features that encode um, the protocol um, that each flow is basically using, as well as aggregate features. If you're interested in those details, I would refer you to the paper. Um, for those. So now that we have these features, the next steps are actually pretty standard machine learning. We use a random forest model, a very, very simple model, and the reason for that is that they are highly accurate, they're less prone to overfit compared to some of the more traditional uh, machine learning models, and they have fast training and run times, and the most important uh, feature they provide is that they're somewhat explainable compared to things like DNNs. And in our evaluation, we use um, detections from the, again, 5% of VMs that Azure already is protecting. And so we have, quote unquote, ground truth for those VMs. And um, this, ha this data set it has about a 1 million VMs um, that uh, we are monitoring. Um, and what we wanted to evaluate is what is the accuracy of the model? What features help detection? Um, what are the sources of false and true positives? How does it compare to currently deployed solutions? Um, and many, many more questions. Due to time constraints, I'm only going to answer the first question here. If you're interested about the other details, strongly encourage you to refer to the paper. So overall, we, what, how well do we compare to the compromise detection systems that Azure provides? As I mentioned earlier, it's 95% of a true positive rate with a 1% um, false positive rate. But the more interesting thing is that we also provide a confidence score that, that tells you how much you can trust the output of this system. And what we see is well, the legitimate VMs and non-compromised VMs are highly separable from the compromised VMs. The difference is actually very, very clear. And so using the features that we were able to construct, it's very easy to classify those compromised VMs. So I'd like to conclude um, by just reiterating the contributions that we've had. We create a system that can use the 5% of the VMs that have strong compromise detection systems deployed on them and that, that we can use for a constant stream of labels to use for training. 
we create um, a more scalable ver uh, feature set that allows us to encode the change in the flow pattern of a VM once it was, co was compromised. And um, we have an extensive evaluation in the paper if you're interested, and I'm happy to take questions and talk to you offline also if you're interested. Hi, so Hi. Uh, I have a question. Uh -huh. uh, you talked about how uh, what you look for is changes in behavior, but you also talked about how VMs can get compromised very quickly. Um, how do those fit together? Um, so basically, we have what we do is we look at the behavior of the VM every 10 minutes. So our goal for detection is to be, is to be as fast as 10 minutes. So yes, you might get compromised, and we would have a 10-minute de delay in detecting that you were compromised, and that's a trade-off that we take. Uh, thank you for the great talk and uh, Chen from AWS. And uh, my question is about like, uh, did you try uh, to see the difference like, of your uh, uh, model performance when you tried uh, in on online inference? Uh, cu currently, I think in the paper is basically offline validation. And uh, what's the difference? Uh, like, because uh, I was thinking when the uh, time uh, effective. And uh, the uh, uh, the change uh, in the cloud will be dynamic. So, what's the difference there? So, um, I don't have a concrete answer for you yet because we are in the process of deploying the solution, and so we, it hasn't been deployed yet. The full solution, this the collection agent has been in production for two years, but not the um, ML model itself. Um, what I can tell you is that um, our hypothesis is that with constant retraining, we are able to relearn changes over time, but that's a hypothesis that we need to verify and we haven't done so yet. Okay. One more one. question. Yeah. Quick one. Uh, on top of uh, accuracy, do you have precision recall? Um, yeah, so if you look at the paper, okay. we show Thanks. those numbers, yeah. Thanks, the speaker, once again, please.